Welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. We have allowed ourselves to become so disconnected and ignorant about something that is as intimate as the food that we eat. Be prepared to grow your own for victory. God said I need somebody strong enough to clear trees and heave bales, yet gentle enough to yean lambs and wean pigs and tend the pink foamed pullets who will stop his mower for an hour to splint the broken leg of a meadowlark. So God made a farmer. Well, hello and welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. I'm your host, Harold Thornbro, and boy, we got a really good one for you today. I'm going to be joined today by Melissa K. Norris, and she's going to come on and tell us about what's going on with her, talk to us a little bit about what got her into homesteading, and a little about her homestead, and uh, what she's doing new these days with her new book, and so on and so forth. So look forward to that conversation and sharing that with you. Uh, before we jump into that, though, I thought I'd just talk a little bit about what we've been doing around here. It has been hunting season. Uh, hunting season is a fun time of the year for me. I, I love spending time in the woods. Uh, I always get a little bit disappointed when I haven't got anything yet. So uh, I I have yet to see a deer. Uh, but like I said, time spent in the woods just never feels like wasted time to me. I always enjoy my time out there. That being said, other things do tend to sacrifice a little bit. Like I don't get a chance to work on the homestead quite as much uh, doing things that I enjoy doing. I do the basic stuff and then I hit the woods. And, uh, you know, it also means a little less time on social media and podcasting and blogging, things like that. I do kind of give up some of that to, to spend some time in the woods this time of the year. But, uh, hey, that's okay. You know, it's usually for just a short time. And, and I'll usually get one deer, sometimes two, and then I'm done for the year. I usually don't go back out. So I'm kind of hoping it comes early this year, but it hasn't so far. I didn't get out a lot with a bow, and I've only been out a couple times with a gun. So, uh, we'll, we'll see, uh, how it goes, but, uh, hopefully got my fingers crossed. Hopefully I'll, uh, get some meat in the freezer. Um, also this time of the year, I like to, uh, set up my, my fodder growing system. And, um, I usually don't grow fodder through the summertime for my uh, rabbits. Uh, but in the winter time I do just give them that, that extra, you know, something green to eat. And, uh, plus I eat a little bit of it. We usually use the sunflower fodder, uh, sometimes do a little bit of wheat fodder, um, but it's real easy to do. But I, I find that I don't need it in the summertime. There's just so much forage and there's so much extra stuff out of the garden to feed them uh, on top of their feed and, and hay that I just don't need to. So, But I always look forward to setting all that up and growing some fodder all through the winter time. So we've been doing that, getting ready for that. Um, finished getting the greenhouse set up for the winter. Ready to start growing some leafy greens in there. And uh, we've been just doing our Thanksgiving preparations, making our purchases on a few Thanksgiving uh, uh, items and uh, getting ready to have some family over and some great times. And uh, it's one of my favorite times of the year for sure. I really enjoy Thanksgiving and just spending spending time with the family and just relaxing for a couple days. You know, I get a couple extra days off work right then and it's just a, it's just a nice time. I enjoy it. And we usually, you know, of course, my wife always goes out and does the, and the, and the kids, they always go out and do the shopping the next day or that, you know, that next morning, but I'm not into all that. So <laughs> that's usually just some time for me to maybe go do a little hunting, if anything else. So, uh, well, with all that out of the way, let's just get on to this interview with uh, Melissa Kane Norris. I know you're really going to enjoy it. I'm joined today on the podcast by homesteader, blogger, author, and podcaster, Melissa K. Norris. Hey, Melissa, welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. Thank you, Harold. I am excited to be here. Longtime fan of your work, and so I'm excited to be on the show. Oh, I bet you you haven't been listening to me or checking out my stuff as long as I've been listening to you. <laughs> You've been doing this a little longer than I have, so <laughs> yeah, I really love your podcast. Uh, I think everybody in my audience probably knows who you are, but why don't you uh, just take a few minutes and uh, and tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you got into homesteading? Yeah. Well, as you said, thank you. My name is Melissa K. Norris, and I do the Pioneering Today podcast, and I'm a fifth-generational homesteader. Mm -hmm. So part of me was born and bred this way. I've always lived um, up in the mountains. In fact, this is kind of a funny thing to say, but I really don't think you hear this much anymore. I am, let's just put that I'm in my mid-30s. That's as close as we'll get to a date. <laughs> and I have lived my entire life on the same road. Oh, so wow. I have never lived off of the road. I know, right? It doesn't happen very often. So 
Uh, my husband and I were lucky enough to be able to purchase some family property that has been in my family for three generations, um, but it was completely raw land. So we put in our well and our septic in our house and, you know, cleared the house and the garden site and all of that about 11 years ago. And so I was raised um, with homesteading a lot of those tendencies. So we always had a big, huge vegetable garden and uh, did seed saving. And then my dad always had beef. So I grew up, we always had, uh, when I was growing up, he had about 120 head of cattle. And so it was, you know, feeding the cows and taking care of the cows. But we didn't have chickens or pork or pigs or anything like that. We just had a big garden and the meat cattle. And so when my husband and I got married, of course, a vegetable garden, I didn't know any, but I didn't know that people didn't. I thought everybody had a vegetable <laughs> garden. And so I did get married young. We got married when I was 18. But the first summer rolls around, and I'm like, you know, we got to look into borrowing somebody's rototiller because at that time we didn't even have the money to buy our own rototiller, you know. <laughs> I'm like, we got to get we got to get the garden prepped for this year. And he just kind of looked at me, and he was like, you want to have a garden? And, I'm, and I looked at him, and I'm like, what do you, what do you mean want? Like, it's just it's what you do. <laughs> it's just normal. What are you <laughs> thinking? Like, no. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean want? It's what we do. And so bless his heart because he was raised in a small town but in the city. And so he just really jumped in. He's like, oh, okay. So we borrowed a, a rototiller and we got our garden and we had one ever since. And he's just really taken to this way of life because we started doing even more and more and more than what, like I said, I was brought up doing. And so now we raise all of our own meat. So we have all of our own um, beef cattle. In fact, we just had a new baby born last night. It was oh, a late, wow. <laughs> a late. Yeah, she she was late, but mama mama got her done, and thankfully it's a sunny day today, so baby's getting warmed up. And um, we raise all of our own beef cattle. We do all of our own laying hens, and then we do all of our own meat chickens, and then we butcher the meat chickens ourselves. But the um, and then we do our own pork, and we all mm -hmm. do it grass fed, organic, and all that. But the pork and the cattle. We do have a local butcher come and do those for us. We have butchered the pigs in the past, mm -hmm. but we don't have um, set up here um, the temperatures. I'm in the Pacific Northwest, and so it's not always cold enough yeah. for us to be able to, to have a spot for the meat. But um, so I, could say, I say we. I was kind of raised in it, but then we've taken it and learned and done actually a lot more than what I was raised with doing. So that's been kind of exciting and lots of learning adventures. And you really get to know your spouse when you get to do <laughs> all of that together. It can yeah. bring out the best and the worst in the both of you, but it's definitely a learning experience. So it's it's been a lot of fun, and it's pretty cool that, that we're able to do that. Yeah. How many acres is your homestead? You know, it's really not that big. We have, well, I guess that that could be a relative statement. Yeah. <laughs> but we're um 14.96 acres, uh -huh. so we're almost 15 acres. Um, but we have um, we have a pretty good growing season here. Of course, it's the Pacific Northwest, so we're we're normally really wet. But um, averagely here, about an acre per um large, like cattle, a large animal. Mm -hmm. You've got about an acre of pasture. And then you've got enough grass to take you through, except in just the middle of winter, which we're, you know, we're feeding hay now. But generally speaking, we can stop feeding about the end of April, beginning of May, and then we don't have to start feeding again until October. So that's okay. that's pretty yeah. good, at least half the year. Yeah. yeah. So you're not overworking the land too bad, for sure. Yeah, that's pretty Oh, normal. yeah, no, yeah. definitely. And, yeah, our herd is small enough, too, that we're able to um, kind of rotate through our mm -hmm. pastures, because you're right, if you... If you let them graze too hard and they're on too small, that then they'll just eat everything down sure. and, and kind of stunt it. So, how yeah. are you? How are you raising your uh, your meat birds? Are you on, you have them on pasture? Or? We do. Well, we have I have a chicken tractor, mm -hmm. and so we'll put them in a chicken tractor, and then we also just have a um, a coop that has a, a decent size run out on it. And we do about so we're we're a family of four, but with you know with having a you know a fold um, pork and then having the beef. And then we also go, um, we're, we're in the mountains, we're about an hour away from the coast, and we just have a little tiny, tiny, um, it's like a 17-foot boat, but it's big enough we can go in the bay and we can go crabbing. Mm -hmm. So we actually go in, in, and we're lucky to get a lot of seafood and stuff. So oh, yeah. about 15 meat birds will take us through, 15 whole chickens will almost take us through a full year. So I don't have to have a huge, you know, I'm not doing like 30 or 40 right, birds, yeah. but we don't have to have too big of an area, which makes it, which makes it nice and a lot easier to, to deal with that amount of birds. So, yeah, we have a chicken tractor and we, we move them around and then we also have a coop with a run out area. I do have a separate coop for the meat chickens. 
than I do for our laying hens. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that's kind of nice. We can It's just easier to, to keep them separate, and there's sure. not the fighting over food right, and right. yeah, all that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know from reading your uh, your blog, too, you're, you're pretty big on foraging as well. Yeah, we do. We do practice quite a bit of, of foraging. Um, like I said, I was, I was lucky enough that my dad was raised in this area, and I've been in this area so my, my whole life. And so um, I grew up doing a decent amount of foraging and then my husband and I always that seems to be the thing like we grew up doing a certain amount and then we find ways to do even more which is fun so we love to forage for mushrooms and that's Mm -hmm. kind of a thing here you know we've got the moisture so usually you have a good mushroom crop but we love to go and my kids it's like better an easter egg hunt and we go (laughs) morel hunting so that's in the spring and and we've got it we've got it time in fact I tell you what one year my son was born um, April 5th and it was two days before I delivered him, and we were out hunting morels because I was not <laughs> going to miss the morels. Yeah, I'm, I'm in Indiana, and that's kind of a big thing around here, too. Everybody goes mushroom hunting in the spring for the morel mushrooms, yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's probably a better up there, but yeah, it's it's pretty good here, too. Seems What's like it, interesting seems is like it used to be better. Go but, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, we actually haven't been, which has been interesting, the whole uh, – climate thing which we won't get into political stuff we're all <laughs> yeah. better off for not doing that but yeah. um we've been a little bit drier here than normally our, our summers have been a little bit hotter and a little bit drier mm-hmm. and even our springs it seems that we're getting we're still getting the same amount of precipitation and rainfall it just tends to be more in the winter it's a little bit more concentrated so mm. yeah if, if it's not um we i've noticed that if it's not quite wet enough then we don't get as good a harvest yeah. i should say on the mushrooms yeah Hmm. Well, sounds like you guys stay pretty busy uh, uh, loading up the pantry and the freezers for uh, for winter time around there. Yes, in fact, it's pretty funny. My daughter is eight now, but when she was little, about uh, three or four, she we just every time. I guess I didn't realize how often. Isn't that the truth with kids? They will let you know if you say something a lot, whether it's good or bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I didn't realize that I said a lot when we're putting this up for winter. Until every time she would see me, you know, get the canner out or she'd see the canner jars or just, you know, a big basket of something bringing in, you know, berries or, you know, produce from the garden. And she'd look at me and she'd say, are we putting this up for winter? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, we're putting this up for winter. So yep. it's kind of, a, kind of a fun little joke. And she still says it now, but it was really cute when she was about three or four. <laughs> that was great. Uh, well, you don't just grow your own vegetables. You do some herbal stuff, too, as well, don't you? Yeah, yeah, we do do some herbal stuff. Um, in fact, it's funny because right before you called, I was just running out to get some rosemary and some sage. But mm. yeah, I do kind of what you would call it a kitchen, an old fashioned kitchen mm-hmm. herb garden. And so, of course, you get to use it. You know, oh, there's nothing like fresh herbs when yeah. you are cooking, but just a flavor profile. But we also have um, really gotten into learning how to use them medicinally mm-hmm. and making a lot of homemade products from those herbs. And so that's, that has been really fun because, well, any, anyone who's interested in homesteading probably had a love of Laura Ingalls and Little House on mm-hmm. the Prairie growing up at some time in their life. And so I love looking back at, at the pioneers and seeing, you know, that used to be the thing is you didn't have, you know, a pharmacy or all these conveniences that we have now. And I'm not saying that they're necessarily bad because I was actually a pharmacy yeah. tech um, for almost 18 years. So, um, but I, it's wonderful to be able to grow that stuff and to just have the knowledge that's been lost within the, just the past couple of generations where it used to be everybody grew their kitchen in a little mm-hmm. bit of a medicinal garden, most housewives, I should say, or homes. And they could just go out and gather that to make whatever, you know, need be. And that's not something that we have a lot anymore. So it's right. been really fun to dive into that and to start kind of helping to bring that back and just even bringing it back within my own home and kitchen because I didn't grow up. My mom didn't, I mean, she might use a little bit of herbs here and there cooking, you know, just a little bit something dried, but having eat fresh herbs, we didn't grow fresh herbs and she definitely didn't grow up in a home where you learned how to use fresh herbs, you know, in a natural medicine cabinet. So mm-hmm. I, yeah, I think it's kind of fascinating. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, 
a lot of homesteaders, you know, we really concentrate on the raising the meat and growing the garden. But what I really enjoy about what you talk a lot about is bringing that stuff in and actually using it in the kitchen. You talk a lot about food uh, preservation and food preparation. And, and I think it was for health reasons that you really started going down this path. Am I right? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Yes. Um, and the other, one of the other things too is because for a lot of people, you know, I realize that not everybody is going to have acreage and is going to be able to do the livestock and raising it all right now. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a, it's a dream or something they're working towards, but everybody has a kitchen. I mean, even if you're living in a tiny apartment, you, you've usually got at least something that you can do a little bit kitchen wise. And I mean, let's face it, we all, we're all eating at least three times a day. Mm-hmm. Um, good Lord, good Lord willing. So I think it's really um, um, important that we kind of focus on that part because it's such an everyday aspect of our lives and that the things that we do every day, add up to really big impact on our overall health and our overall lives. And that was the case for me. Um, goodness, it's been about nine, nine years ago now, I had really bad heartburn, which, you know, you hear, you know, people talk about heartburn, like, oh, goodness, it can be that, that big of a deal. But if you ever had it really bad, then it can be mm-hmm. really disruptive. And I actually got to the point where I was developing um, acid and erosion and I was on up to... Um, it was three different prescriptions, and I kind of had maxed out on on them. But you, you had to take them six times a day because one of them basically was like a chemical band-aid that would coat the stomach where the ulcer was so that you could actually eat without, you know, burning pain. Hmm. And then the other ones were to stop the acid production. But you, the timing of it, because some had to be taken on an empty stomach, some had to be taken after meals, before meals, like it was just crazy. And at that time, I was only in my 20s, and I already thought I was eating fairly clean. Like I said, we've um, mm-hmm. always had our own beef and, and, you know, raised a lot of our food. I hadn't gotten quite not to the point that we're at now. But I felt like I was eating a pretty whole food diet. Like, we didn't go out to eat. Um, when you live an hour away from the closest um, <laughs> fast food restaurant, <laughs> that makes it really easy to avoid going yeah. out to eat all the time. But we weren't eating a lot of fast food and stuff, but... Um, the medicine, like I said, I was on all the max doses you could get, and it, it wasn't controlling it. So the doctor actually said, you know, we're just going to we're gonna send you in, and we're going to do some um, that upper scope. So they're mm-hmm. going to, you know, down your throat and take a look at everything. And go, okay. And so um, they did that, and they did a, when they were in there, they had taken a biopsy of my um, part of my esophagus and my upper stomach. And that really scared me. I mean, you hear the word biopsy, mm-hmm. and, you know, it kind of – kind of starts to throw you, especially cancer. then I, you start thinking cancer um, right away. <laughs> you do. You start thinking cancer right away. And so thankfully the test results came back um, that I did not have cancer. But what they, they showed is I was starting to have cellular change in my upper stomach mm. and my esophagus. And so when you have cell change, it, it wasn't pre-cancer. It was before that stage, mm-hmm. right? So it was it just beginning to see the cellular change. But like I said, it, I was in my late twenties. And so <laughs> they were just said, scary. you know, it, it was, it was scary. And it was a wake up call. But, um, the interesting thing was, you know, the doc, he just said, he goes, you know, you're, you're not over overweight, you know, you're pretty active. You don't have the normal sign or normal symptoms. I should say as someone that we see this with, he goes, and the only way that you're going to be able to control this, he goes, I want to get you off these medications. And I'm thinking, yeah, buddy, I want to be off these medications too, but I'm <laughs> on the max doses and I still can hardly function. And so he handed me this list and he's like, you're going to have to control this with your diet, you know, the foods that you're eating. And I'm like, all right. So I I look at the list and on the list is coffee and chocolate, like right at the top. I'm like, "Mm -mm, hand it back to him. No, no, (laughs) right. Right. But I, you know, I I come home and I have to think about it for a little bit. And I, I start to look at the list and then I really started to look at food, you know, the food that was in our kitchen, the foods that we were eating, and, you know, it was kind of like, okay, well, you stick to these foods. And um, I t- and I tell you what, having a biopsy, that, it burns for days afterwards. Mm, it's actually yeah. quite painful. I had no idea. But um, I just decided, okay, well, I'm going to have to make these changes because, you know, I want to be, I want to be here when my, you know, my kids are older and I don't, I don't want right. to deal with cancer, the esophagus or stomach. So I started looking at these. I started really looking at genetically modified foods at that time there wasn't even as much awareness there was no um, non-gmo label mm-hmm. right we, we really weren't hearing much about that um you know in mainstream media you know a couple blogs here and there you could find stuff and so i really started digging in and, and doing research about the ingredients in 
the, you know, the processed foods. And I said, I already cooked quite a bit from scratch, but I just really started investigating. And so I cut out, oh my goodness, I cut out a lot of stuff to begin with, but I cut out um, coffee and, and chocolate for a while. I cut out everything, high fructose corn syrup, you know, any, all the mm-hmm. labels just went through right. everything in our house and just completely eliminated all of that stuff. And um, what was the amazing part was it took about three months because I slowly had to wean off of these different prescriptions. And, of course, it was with, you know, the doctor and and the pharmacist and stuff, making sure you're overdoing that right. But my point being is by changing our foods and the way that I was eating, I was completely able to get off every single one of the medications. I did not have the heartburn anymore, which medications weren't really controlling anyways, and the GERD. And now it's been almost 10 years, wow. and I have never had to go back off them. So to me, that's just a testament. I mean, right mm-hmm. there, it yeah. is proof about what our foods and how it affects us. But the good news is, so for all of you that are like, I am never giving up my chocolate, my coffee, like, I get you. Yeah. The good news is, is after <laughs> my system had kind of had a time to really heal, and for, you know, now I know a lot more about gut health, and for that to be able to heal, I'm able to bring back chocolate and and coffee. So, good <laughs> you, news is, you some had to figure out a way, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I did, I did, I just couldn't, so yeah, I did, and one of the ways, actually, that I first done was coffee, of course, then I, I switched to organic coffee, mm-hmm. I will tell you, but the other thing is, um, I do cold press now, mm. so if anybody's not familiar with that, it's also called toddy, so here in the Pacific Northwest, we have an espresso stand, I'm not kidding you, like on every other corner, <laughs> <laughs> and so... <laughs> I, I know my coffee a little bit, but cold pressed is where you, you put the grounds in and then you cover it with cold water and you let it sit for 12 to 24 hours and then you strain it out and then you keep that cold brew in the fridge for up to two weeks. Now you can heat it up mm-hmm. if you want it to be hot, but you can also make ice drinks. But the amazing part about this is, is it has 67% less acid when you do it that way because wow. the, acid, the hot water will pull the oils out, right? Mm-hmm. And that's where a lot of the acid is. And so for anybody that's struggling with that, I highly recommend that you, that you check it out. It has a little bit less caffeine, which is usually a good thing yeah, for most of us, especially if you drink more in a cup a day. Yeah. So it, it still has caffeine, a little bit less, but a lot less acid. And so that was the way I was able to um, to bring the coffee back mm. in up on a regular basis. Well, I'm a big coffee drinker, so I might have to look into that. <laughs> It's great in the summer, though, because then yeah. you've got it already iced, ready to go, and then you can just make iced coffees at home, and, and yeah, so. Well, yeah, I know when um, I looked to you a lot back in, you know, five years ago, you were already talking about a lot of this stuff on your blog, and, and I got your book, The Made From Scratch Life, and I was looking into this because I had obvious health issues. Anybody that listens to this podcast knows that what I went through with cancer, and I was looking to start eating from scratch a lot more as well, uh, cooking from scratch. And, and, um, you know, it, it, it's amazing that you can go, I'm in my mid forties, but you can go most of your life just getting so used to the, uh, the, the what's at the grocery store prepackaged, you know, uh, process Mm -hmm. and you just make a lifestyle out of it, you know? And, and we did that. And that was, (laughs) that's how we ate every day. We thought we were eating healthy, you know, because you buy things that, you know, they package them in a way that makes them look healthy. They they talk about it on the yes. package like it's healthy, but you oh, can yeah. find out it, it's fat. not. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and you think you're not eating that bad, but it turned out we were eating pretty bad, you know. So, yeah, we started. I remember I have just, you know, I grew up on a homestead as well, and we um, – we, we raised our own animals and we did a lot of things, but you know, my mom, I, I grew up in a generation where, you know, mom was in the kitchen. I was out helping my dad do the farm work outside, you know, and, uh, yeah. I never really learned any of that stuff Well, my wife's a city girl. So she never really knew any of that stuff. So it was kind of a learning process for us, you know, and, and, um, I just remember the first time we made homemade bread from scratch and just what a sense of accomplishment that was. And it's just an amazing thing just to start small like that and then just start adding to what you can do cooking like that. It is. And, and I think too, I mean, in, in defense of, of, a, of a lot of people is you've got, just like you said, like your, your wife, for instance, who grew up in the city, if you didn't grow up in a family that was already doing things from scratch, mm-hmm. you really have a lot of people who don't know that you can make those at home and that it's actually pretty darn easy mm-hmm. to make a lot of the things at home. I mean, you, you just literally have people like, I remember you know, going to friend's house and stuff as a teenager. And like I said, my, my mom, you know, she was a stay at home mom. 
she, you know, sewed and made almost all of our stuff um, from scratch, more out of necessity than necessarily want. I mean, I'm sure every now and then mm-hmm. she would have loved to have went and bought a pizza and not right. had a good dinner, but, you know, and so I was really fortunate to grow up that way. But then I started going to other people's houses. And in fact, I remember this as I was in high school and if we had cookies, I mean, we didn't have store-bought cookies. That was just, it wasn't in the budget. And so we, my mom baked a lot. You know, we had cookies instead of home, but I had never had Oreos. So I'm not kidding. I'm 15 years old, and I go to a friend's house and stay the night. She was like, we're going to have Oreos and milk tonight. And I'm like, what is that? Like, I'm not kidding. And <laughs> you so, are such a weird like, kid. Never had, I know, totally. <laughs> and she's like, you've never had Oreos? And I'm like, no. I mean, I've seen them on the store shelf, but never, I'd never had Oreos and milk before. <laughs> Wow. And so we had them, and I'll tell you what, they, they tasted pretty good. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them that. Like I, I, but I didn't think, I mean, to me, like, she was super excited about them, and I'm like, oh, no, all right, but <laughs> they weren't any, weren't any big thing to me. But yeah. you do, you have, you know, you've got um, that. It's not that necessarily people don't want to. It's just a lot of people don't even realize that you can do it. Or, I mean, we're really busy. I mean, we're blessed with all these modern conveniences. And, you know, I love my washing machine. I will tell you, I'm glad I'm not having to do it outside mm-hmm. yeah, by hand. Um, yeah. I, well, I really, I am, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for electricity, but we have a wood stove. I know how to cook outside. We do a lot of Dutch oven cooking. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I'm grateful that I have those skill sets, but I'm also, you know, going to use my electricity yeah, while I have it for I'm all, something. I'm all about modern I'd, homesteading for sure as well. <laughs> right? Yeah. And that's where I'm at. But, you know, you really can make a lot of the foods quickly. It, it, they don't have to be as time-consuming as, as we tend to think. And mm-hmm. so, so you think about homemade crackers. Now, where I live, it's going to take me. We have a small grocery store near us. It's about 10 to 12 miles away from us. And so for me to run to the store, it's going to take me at least a half an hour there and back, and then about 50 minutes, about 45 minutes just to get to the store. Now, if I want to go down to where there's large grocery stores, that's about uh, 45 minutes one way. Mm-hmm. So I can make homemade crackers, no kidding, make the dough and have them ba- whipped up, baked, and ready to eat in 15 minutes. I mean, this time of year, you can't even get in, find a parking spot and get inside the store and find a cart in the time that you can have right. them made. Yeah. And so that's my point. You know, and you can make them you know, totally from scratch with all, you know, good ingredients. Mm-hmm. And so that's really what um, – as I, I try to share, is how quickly you can make things. They taste better than the store-bought, and they're definitely saving you not only money, but they're saving you time, too. That was a, that was a big fear for us, you know, because I work, I work a lot of hours because I'm a truck driver, and my wife works full-time, and we was really concerned about that if we would have the time to do a lot of things from scratch. But we've, we found ways to just work it in the evenings and prepare things ahead of time. And, uh, and you know, we're... Uh, we're big fans of the slow cooker, you know, because it's, it's easy to put things in there and have them ready for dinner the next day or, or whatever. But, uh, yeah, we were able to do that. But you're right. I mean, you, it's when you really add it up and think about it, all the running around you got to do and things like that. Yeah, it's it's not as bad as people think it is. Yeah, no, it's, it's really not. And there's a lot of, like you said, just a little bit of plan work. You can, mm-hmm. In fact, I love my slow cooker, but I'll tell you what I love even more that I found. I know I've had it since May, and that is the Instapot, the electric uh, pressure you cooker. Know, a lot of people are talking about that, and I'm, yeah, I've been looking at, looking at them because, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have to say, besides my All-American canner and my home grain mill, the Instapot is probably my top kitchen modern homesteader tool. Mm. I just love that thing. It, you can just do so much in it. But, you know, and even like for Thanksgiving now, and I use this all year round, but especially this time is I make up all my pie crust and it's in the freezer. So then on Thanksgiving day, all I have to do is I just have to pull it out. My pie filling's already canned from this summer, the harvest that can up all of our pie filling. Mm-hmm. And so I do that with biscuits too. I've got my biscuit dough done. They're cut out, toss them in the freezer. And then when you just need to make a quick meal or you need to have just a quick add on, you just pull them out and you bake them from frozen. So like mm-hmm. all of these, all this convenient stuff, you know, that people are used to buying in the store, like, you know, biscuits in the can and just mm-hmm. a lot of those different things, you know, people buy pastry dough frozen already. You can do that at home so that you've got it ready for quick convenience yeah. as well, but it's all totally from scratch. And it yeah. tastes so much better. Well, I will say this, though. it it You tend to, I don't know, I, just, I think when you eat a lot of the garbage for years, your palate adjusts to that where uh, um, 
uh, food cooked from scratch at home does taste different and maybe not as appealing for a while until you kind of get used to it and then it tastes better because your palate just seems like it adjusts. You know, I, I don't know. That maybe sounds weird, but that's something I've experienced. You have to kind of get used to eating things sometimes and it starts, you really, you really like it. Yeah. And sometimes too, you know, you're not going to get the same, um, can, you know, consistency from, you know, a lot of store bought stuff pretty much every time you buy that and you cook whatever it is it's going to turn out the same. And so when you're getting used to making it from scratch, just like, Mm -hmm. especially with things like pie crust and bread dough, and that is you learn and doesn't usually take you very long. And I try to put a lot of that in my books, like, Mm -hmm. you know, the the different tips and the nuances that you only really learn by doing something a lot. And of course, if someone hands you those tips, then you're cutting that process down, but you got to go by the feel of the dough, Mm -hmm. which is, I know a lot of people are like, what? (laughs) But yeah, you you really learn that the recipe is kind of a guideline and that you have to go by, you know, the feel of the dough and mm-hmm. by the way it looks in order to get those more consistent um, things. And, and there's, and see with the store-bought, it's really funny because everybody loves homemade fresh bread out of the oven, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know anybody who's not excited to get that. When it comes out and it's anything warm out of the oven, oh, yeah. oh my goodness, it's so <laughs> So good. I, I but I have like, to tell have you, to cut a piece off right away as soon as it comes out. <laughs> right? <laughs> right away. I know. <laughs> Same here. But the funny thing is, as I have to say, is every now and then, and that's where modern homesteaders is we, we learn a little bit of balance. Every now and then, we'll get store bought bread for whatever reason, and I still buy organic. But because my kids are so not used to it, mm-hmm. they get excited if they get to pick out a loaf of store-bought bread because it's something, <laughs> it's different, you know, it's kind of like, yeah. it's, it's a treat, which sounds so odd, but yeah, but I agree with you. Our taste buds, especially because a lot of store-bought food has high fructose corn syrup in it. And it's got a lot of those different additives mm-hmm. and stuff that they, they trick the brain and they trick the body. And I think it takes a while for us to almost, I hate to use the word detox, but it does. It, it takes your, your taste buds a while to make that transition. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like if you already eat like a lot of sugary foods and then all of a sudden you cut out sugar and then you eat carrots. Well, it's going to be amazing because in like in two weeks, those carrots are going to taste so sweet. But like the first couple of days, they don't really taste that sweet. So I agree. Your, your taste buds definitely yeah. start to transition and appreciate the food more. Well, I've seen people eat grass-fed beef for the first time and they don't like it maybe sometimes right off the bat because it tastes so different from what you'd buy at the store, you know, and then it just takes, I I love it, but you know, it takes a, it's a, there's an adjustment there, I think, you know, and you have to, I think you even have to cook it different, you know, than what you would the stuff from the store. It just, you know, it have to be, it's just different and, and it takes people a little while to adjust, uh, adjust to it. But I mean, you have to do that if you want to, I mean, the reason we're doing this is to eat healthier and, and, you know, to not have the problems <laughs> that are associated to the, right. today's food, um, cancer being a huge one and just all these other health problems that are out there. But, um, you know, and, and just in, in the, with cooking, you talk a lot about, and I even talked a lot about in the past is, is um, your household cleaning products and things like that. Uh, it's good to do those, make those for, from scratch as well. Yeah, completely. You know, it, it's funny because I first started with the food, obviously, because mm-hmm. that was where I was having it. I saw immediate results. But then it really started to open my eyes to, you know, our skin is our biggest organ. Mm-hmm. And what we touch, our skin absorbs it into our bodies and into our blood stream, streams. And, I mean, quite frankly, that's why they do a lot of transdermal things because it, it can bypass certain parts of the area and get into the body mm-hmm. super quick. But on that same token, what you're using to clean your home and the soaps that you're using, and mm-hmm. for us ladies who like to use makeup, and, you know, I'm a homesteader, but I'm still a really homesteader. I'll, <laughs> I'll just tell you, I like my lip gloss, and, and I still wear some makeup sometimes. Mm-hmm. And so all of that, you know, moisturizers, just all of that is being, you know, in your skin and absorbed into your skin. And I think it really is, I think a lot of the problems that we're seeing, of course, I'm not a medical doctor, but I really think that it's, a combination of everything. Our systems are so overloaded, not just the foods that we eat, but the other things that Mm -hmm. we have in our home. We don't even realize the chemical load that we're exposed to on a daily basis. Right. Yeah. We started out just 
I mean, the the simplest thing was for us was just to make our own laundry detergent, you know, our laundry soap. And we started there, mm-hmm. and then you just kind of work around. We started, you know, substituting vinegar for a lot of cleaners and things like that. And it's amazing that the things you can replace with just some simple products that I believe work just as good, if not better, in some cases. I completely agree. In fact, when it comes to oven cleaner, and this is in, um, in my first book, The Made From Scratch Life, mm-hmm. baking soda Cleans an mm-hmm. oven yep. way better and your sink. I mean, baking soda, baking soda and vinegar are my two go yeah, I mean, pretty much everything we clean in our house. Yeah, it's just two, two simple ingredients in the vinegar. You can make it yourself. You right. got apple scraps. You're set. I mean, it's just amazing what we can do. But I will agree with you too. Like you said, you guys start it. You start with one thing and then you start moving out. And mm-hmm. I think that's perfect because I think if you try to do everything all at once, mm-hmm. you're going to completely overwhelm yourself. Right. And so I think it is so smart, just like you said, and that's kind of how we did too, is I, I started with one thing and I saw how easy it was. I saw how much money it saved me. I saw how much better it was, you know, for my, my family. And then it makes you excited because you feel like, you know, you won in an area. You're like, this is awesome. And then you're excited to move to that next area and you're just slowly, you know, changing things over and gaining confidence and building these skill sets and these different, you know, products in your home up over time, which I think mm. is much better than trying, like, don't go to your cupboard and pull every single thing out <laughs> <laughs> and replace it all at once because you're, you're, you're kind of setting yourself up for failure no, there. It's pretty overwhelming to try to do too much at one time. Absolutely. I agree with you. I bought your, uh, the made from scratch life a few years ago and I was just grabbing it off my shelf here and, uh, looking through it. And, and you talk a lot about that. You have suggestions for a lot of cleaning, like you mentioned, uh, and, and meals and, and just a lot of stuff they're making from scratch. It's a great book, but you actually just came out with another book, didn't you? I did. Yeah, actually, just this October 2017, mm-hmm. um, the new book, Handmade, The Modern Guide to Made from Scratch Living came out. And I'm, like, I'm really excited about it because it builds off of the made from scratch life, but I'm excited. This one has even more recipes in it. So this, and it's bigger. So this is one's 251 pages. Mm. And what was really fun is this time um, I talked with the publishing company and they let us put some pictures in there because I'm very visual. So mm-hmm. this one has got picture tutorials. And so it just really builds upon it's all new recipes. There's over a hundred recipes and it definitely is the cracker recipe is in here. Like I was saying, you make your crackers from start to eating in 15 minutes. But there's a lot of those types of tips and recipes. I've got my great grandmother's recipes in here and even recipes and tips from the Great Depression era, which just fascinates me. Mm-hmm. And part of that is my dad was raised through the end, the middle and end of the Great Depression. But even when the Great Depression ended, it didn't really um, change the way they lived because they pretty much lived where the only thing you bought from the store was um, sometimes was cornmeal, you know, flour, and sugar. So they pretty much raised everything themselves. Mm. They didn't have electricity or running water. They had a hand pump wow. and an outhouse <laughs> um, until he was a, a teenager and moved out. And so I actually felt really fortunate. And when I was younger, you know, I didn't necessarily appreciate all the life lessons Dad was trying to teach me, especially as a teenager mm. when I was wanting what everybody you else never had. never do. <laughs> Right, I know, such a universal truth. But now I'm really grateful for it. And so I've gotten to share, like I said, a a lot of those recipes and those bits of wisdom and stuff Mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, are so quickly being lost in today's society. So I was able to tuck a lot of those in there, which is really, I'm just thrilled about, has been really exciting. Um, And then we also have, and this one, which I was thrilled is, we've got, further ones, making your own homemade soap, making beeswax candles and mason jars, herbal infused products. And the awesome thing is we were talking about how these things don't take a lot of time. Most of these products, with the exception of um, cold processed soap, because when Mm -hmm. you're dealing with water water, that takes about, you need about an hour. But all the rest of the projects, like no joke, between 20 and 30 minutes, and you know, you've made up an entire batch at a time Mm -hmm. and you have them done. So it's really actually efficient especially this time of year if you're going um, shopping and the lines are just atrocious <laughs> yes well that sounds like the kind of book that every homesteader definitely needs on their shelf because we could all use some more ideas for things we want to do and like you said so many of us have started out small and we're doing one or two or three or four things and we just need to keep adding to that and learning new things and that's what homesteading is all about just keep adding to your uh, your skill set and what you can do and, and, and uh, 
getting to learn some more things like that. So, yeah, it sounds like it's going to be a, a great addition for homesteaders to get their hands on. Yeah, uh, yes, I, I agree. And like I said, it's just everything that we've learned and, and been doing and then pulling, you know, back from like my great grandma and my grandma's and all of being able to put that in to just kind of one volume. In fact, it was funny because as mm-hmm. I was getting all the recipes and stuff out, you know, I'm pulling them all from, you know, you've got your, my little, I've got a little recipe notebook where I've got everything or, you know, I've got all this. So I'm pulling it out from my sources. And so now I actually have it on my own cookbook shelf because it's so much easier for me to just <laughs> grab them. Gotta go look it's up not so stuff, bad huh? it's my yeah. own book, but yeah, it's all the recipes we normally use and it's just all in one compiled right. form there for me, right? The book. And so, yeah, so I, <laughs> it's just kind of comical, but it's true. So yeah, no, it's, it's really a great resource um, for anybody who's looking to do more handmade things and to get back to those, but also with the time, saving tips and tricks in there it's for the modern part. You nailed it. It's for modern homesteaders. What, what, what's your favorite recipe in the whole book? Oh, oh favorite? Oh, my hard, goodness. <laughs> that's hard. That's hard. Um, probably one of my favorites would be this time of year is Grandma's Pumpkin Roll because okay. I love I love pumpkin roll. And then the other one would probably have to be the buttermilk biscuits because mm, yeah. I tell you what, I am just a biscuit girl. I just yeah. love those. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, well, that right there probably just made a ton of people want to run out and get the book right there. Pumpkin <laughs> roll. I've never had a homemade pumpkin roll before. That does sound great. Oh, you haven't? No, oh, never. Harold. Yeah. Okay, you you got to do it. You. <laughs> oh my goodness, I've got pictures in there. I'm not kidding you. Grandma has to make two pumpkin rolls because at Thanksgiving and Christmas we will eat one before like anybody's even gotten seconds or everybody's got a piece. And so she has to hide one in the back, but we all know that she has it and that she has to bring it up so everybody can finish up and take some home with them. <laughs> it's gotta be one of the more difficult recipes in the book though, right? You know, it's really not that really? difficult. People get really intimidated by the rolling part. Uh-huh, and yeah. I totally understand because the first time I wanted to make one, well, we kind of have this standing joke. My husband's grandmother is like, she's one of just the best bakers ever. And she will give us her recipes because my sister-in-law and myself will ask her, you know, Grandma, we, we would like your recipe for whatever. And so she always writes it down. She gives us her recipe. Then we go to make it. And we ask her, Grandma, this is exactly how you make it, right? This is your, exactly what you do with it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll both go to make it. And it's never as good as Grandma's. Like, it never it. tastes the same. <laughs> Something. And so I would get so tired of like, every time I tried one of the recipes, my husband was like, this doesn't taste this right. This doesn't taste like grandma's. <laughs> and so when it came time to do the pumpkin roll, I'm like, it's going to taste like grandma's because I'm going down to her kitchen and she's showing me exactly how she makes this thing. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and so that's what I did. I went down and I got a lesson from grandma. And so I have all of her tips in there on how you do it. And I actually just did a video of it live, which let me tell you, I was so nervous doing it live because I'm like, the only time this thing will crack is the one time I do it live, but it didn't. And so if anybody wants to watch it, they can um, go to my Facebook page and they can actually see how you do it live. I love how you do that on your Facebook page. You share a lot of things like that on your Facebook page, videos of of preparing things. And and, I mean, I've seen, I've seen a ton of your, your videos. You do a lot of those. Yeah. I try to do one a week. It doesn't always happen that I do one a week, but I really do try because you know, I'm just like, like I said, I, when you are doing something for the first time, mm-hmm. it really helps to be able to watch it. Oh yeah. There's yeah. just, you know, there's just something about visually being able to see it. So, um, that's what I did. I'm like, I had to go watch grandma make the pumpkin roll. So it's only fair that I pass on to other people showing them exactly. Well, sounds like a, sounds like a book. Everybody's going to need to put on their shelf. Uh, now you actually have a, a class you do along with the book, right? I do. Yeah, we have the Handmade Masterclass. So one of the cool things about it is when you purchase that, you get a digital copy of the book and you also get a physical paperback copy of the book mailed to you. And so mm-hmm. it's all all in there. And we've got seven Masterclass videos. So walk you through how to do make your own soap. So we've got both melt and pour if people want to do that with their kids. And then we also do how you do the cold process, like the real firm scratch soap with lye water. We go through all safety and share recipes. And the fun thing is, is I use all natural items. So there's not any synthetic fragrance oils. We use essential oils and we actually use natural spices and herbs to get Mm. colors on the soap. So all of it's totally done natural. Um, Should I do beeswax, candles in a mason jar, um, herbal infused body butters? 
And then, of course, lip balms. But the really fun thing, so this will be for the girly girls on there that are girly girl homesteaders, which were totally a thing, is I show how to make your own tinted lip balms. Basically, it's homemade mm-hmm. lipstick without all of those, you know, filler nasty ingredients. Right. Because I had a really hard time finding natural makeup that, one, had ingredients that I felt okay with using, especially mm-hmm. when it's on your lips and around your eyes. But two, were actually you know, colors and looked as good as the stuff that I didn't want to use anymore. So I've got a complete color guide um, that people can use. And then I teach you how to make your own colors because, you know, we're homesteaders and we like to customize <laughs> things. We want it just our way. Well, <laughs> no, that's so, real important to yeah. me, but I am a father of three adult daughters. So I know how important it is to women that they have these things. <laughs> It is. And then we do um, how to make your own herbal ointments and salves and your own herbal infused oils. And there's some bonus videos, too. And so we have the seven masterclass ones that show you, walk you through, you know, step by step how to make all of those things. Mm -hmm. And then we've got how to make homemade donuts from scratch, um, how to make your own sourdough starter as well. And so you're going to get some other kitchen videos in there, too, that actually go back to your food prep and doing those, in, you know, really mm-hmm. traditional ways. Yeah, sounds like so many of these things, would, especially this time of year, would make great gifts for people. Yes. It, what, yeah, the book itself, in fact, if anybody's listening that's uh, on my Christmas list, just so you know, you're getting a copy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it does make, yes, it, they, you know, books, I love getting books as Christmas gifts because, like you said, yeah. homesteaders, I'm, we're always learning. I don't, I think that's one of the biggest assets that a homesteader has is our thirst for knowledge and to learn new skill sets. I mean, we're Mm -hmm. not ever, you know, just sitting where we're at. We're always wanting to learn more. And so I love getting books, but getting the books and then make, you know, making the items because they make great gifts. We've Mm -hmm. got how to make cinnamon salsa ornaments, you know, some of those, you know, just really old fashioned fun things that you can do with kids too. And then there's also um, some bonus coupon codes. So there's um, 45% off for an apron. Because if you're doing a lot of cooking, an apron's going to save you. I'm a messy cook. I always need an apron. <laughs> um, and then some other, just some fun, fun bonuses off of other supplies and um, download, home, you know, gift mm-hmm. tags so that when you're making your products, you can just print it out and put the label on there already done up custom-wise for you. Yeah. So, yeah. Sounds like a great deal. Well, I'll definitely um, uh, make this easy for people to find. I'll put links to all these things in the show notes uh, in today's episode. That way people can just pop over there and see links to, to all this stuff that you're talking about. I mean, you're, I, I really like your first book. I, it was made from the made from scratch life. Your very first book. It was, wasn't it? Yeah, it was my very first book. I had kind of self published um, before that a, mm-hmm. a much smaller version and then um, a traditional publisher um, expressed interest. And so we, pulled the self-published version and mm. just made it so much better, yeah. packed a lot more in there and made it the book it should have been to begin with. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. And so, yeah, so that's a, the first book. Um, yep. So I've got two, uh, the made from scratch okay. life and then yeah, handmade that just okay. came out. I'll definitely have links yeah. to those and, and your, your, uh, your master class. And, uh, sounds like it'd be just a great thing to get into. I, um, now who did you make this book for primarily? I mean, was it just for just any, anybody that's looking to maybe just take the next step into homesteading and really just get started with it? Or was, I mean, this book going to be for experienced homesteaders, beginner homesteaders. I mean, who, who'd be interested in this? Yeah. You know, it's for beginning, it's for beginning and intermediate and even advanced homesteading. So, mm-hmm. you know, I wrote it, for, it's every, you know, it's everything that I've been doing in my kitchen you know, for the past, you know, four or five years as Mm -hmm. far, but a lot of it goes back a lot further. So basically it's like the things that I do and we make all the time and kind of through the season. So we've got like a holiday chapter in there where we talk about, you know, Thanksgiving, of course, and Christmas, but even birthdays and, you know, different holidays. And then we've got fermenting in here too. So Um, You know, I do love my canner. I love my canner. But, you know, sourdough, traditional Mm old-fashioned sourdough, and then just doing fermented vegetables. Yeah, the gut health aspect of all those things is really huge. It is, as well as the preserving, because, Mm -hmm. you know, when I'm, you know, you bring in your cucumbers from the garden and you throw them in the fridge, usually about a week to a week and a half before they're going to start to break down. Mm -hmm. Well, you can still have those essentially raw because fermented food is still raw, right? It's not cooked. And you can ferment that, and then you put it in the fridge once the fermentation process has been completed. I have fermented, like I've had a jar in the back that we just kind of, you know, forgot about or didn't go through. I have pulled it out. It's been nine months, and Mm. it is still crispy, delicious. I mean, so the preserving factor, I mean, there's the health Mm -hmm. factor, too. 
But the preserving factor from my homesteader heart gets me really excited because it really keeps that going. Yeah, we make a lot of sauerkraut around here. That's our big thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sauerkraut. And actually, my daughter loves fermented garlic pickles as her dill garlic pickles are one of her favorites mm, so good, yeah. we, we've had a lot of we put a lot of those up yeah <laughs> well it sounds like uh it sounds like anybody could really benefit from it even if you're just getting started into it or, or even uh well experienced in, in preserving food and preparing food and, and just doing things from scratch because there's just there's gonna be more in there than what you're already doing so that's great i'm, I'm definitely gonna have links to all these things in the show notes and um I, let's just kind of close the show up with you have anything you would like any advice you'd have for for someone who's just thinking about making the lifestyle change and getting into homesteading this modern homesteading movement and changing their life around and eating more healthy and you know just kind of going down this path yeah and i would definitely say like we kind of talked about earlier is to start small. Mm -hmm. So my my best advice, and this is kind of how I started too, and because you're going to grow over time. But my best advice is, I usually is, is starting with your food. Mm -hmm. So I want you to to look at what you're eating on a consistent basis. So you know something you're eating every day, if not every day, like every other day, something that you're eating quite a bit of, and you're consuming it that you're not making from scratch, or you know you're buying from the store, and it doesn't have the best of ingredients in it. Yeah. So pick one thing, and that one thing I want you to find a healthier version of, and it's usually going to be homemade. And I just want you to work that into your daily routine, your weekly routine, until it just becomes a part of normal life that you're making that from home, from, you know, good, nourishing, whole food ingredients. And then after that has just become a normal pattern, and it's just in your life and you're used to it, then pick the next thing. Mm -hmm. And you're just going to slowly start doing that. And then pretty soon, you know, a couple of years down the road, almost everything, you know, in your house or, you know, what you're normally eating, do it. And we kind of do the 80-20 the rule, which a lot of people are familiar with. So 80% of the time, I want to make sure that we're eating really healthy and really well. And then the other 20%, I'm not going to stress about it because if you get too dogmatic, that's almost unhealthy too, because you really you know, you're stressed so much about mm -hmm. it that if you're eating something that's not healthy, that that, that can be bad too. So try to give a little bit of grace yeah, <laughs> in all have, areas. You got to have your coffee and chocolate. That's right. <laughs> you do. You got to just give yourself grace. So, but that would be it: is, is to look at what you're consuming on a regular basis mm -hmm. and start there. Pick one thing and then just slowly build and build. And even that, um, as far as growing or raising your own food too, is pick one thing that you're buying from the store. I mean, and if you don't have a lot of land or a lot of time. Mm -hmm. It could be just some simple herbs because you can grow those in a little itty-bitty container. You can get a lot out of them in the summertime. They're easy to dry. You don't have to have any special equipment. And it may just be that this year I'm going to grow all of my own sage or all of my own basil for the whole year, and I'm going to preserve it and take us through. I mean, you can start small mm -hmm. and just keep working up. Yeah, I think when I – first got into this uh, in the first month i built a couple four by eight uh, raised bed garden beds and i baked our first loaf of bread and i started doing the laundry detergent and it was those three things and it was just that for a little while and then we kind of went to the next thing after that but yeah just started slow and and, and those three things i thought made a huge difference you know uh, i mean i felt way better about what i was doing just starting that yeah it does it, it builds your confidence and it does mm -hmm. i mean every little thing it really does add up into, you know, the overall picture. And I like I like how you said, so that's it. So pick one thing from the kitchen, one thing that you're cleaning with, and one thing that you're growing to eat. I yeah. think that's just the perfect recipe. Yeah, it was, a, and it just got us going down like three different paths all at once, but it wasn't so overwhelming that it, you know, burned us out or anything like that. And, uh, well, I think that's great advice, um, what you give. And, and before we give your contact info, is there just anything else you'd like to leave us with? You know, I just want to say that I just feel, honestly, is so blessed to be with a community of people who are looking, you know, we're, we're questioning just because we've always, you know, done something some way or that, you know, you've, you've got modern society as a whole, you know, going to the grocery store and buying this, buying this things is that we're questioning, well, is that really the best thing? You know, we're, right. we're starting to really in, investigate and to look at things. And sometimes it is, you know, sometimes you'll start to research and you look at something and you're like, no, this is, you know, this is just fine. But I think that we are so blessed to live in a time that we've got the access to the internet. And I know, I know mm -hmm. 
sometimes the internet and social media cannot always yeah. be a bad thing, but yeah. I'm, you know, they can be a bad thing, but I think we're really, really blessed to be able to connect with so many like people that I we mean. are creating a movement. I mean, modern homesteading, it is a movement and a great one. And, and I just think it's amazing that we live in this day and age where we've got the modern part, but we're able to bring back these good parts and be a part mm-hmm. of this movement that's getting us all back to, you know, a healthier and a, and a better state for everybody involved. There's a, there's a lot of people changing their lives for the better going down this path. I, I believe that. Yeah, oh, that, no, I completely. I mean, it's been life-changing for me. Mm-hmm. It, it's life-changed yeah, me my too. health. Same thing with you. I mean, it really is. It sounds, you know, you hear people kind of toss that around a lot, you know, kind of can play, oh, it's cliche. Oh, it's life-changing. But, mm-hmm. yeah, it really, it is. It, it is, is life-changing. You'll feel like a different person, and it, it'll, it'll just take you down a path. that'll. I think it's a way better way of life. It really is. And it doesn't have to be all-consuming. I, I, don't, I don't think that's even healthy. Uh, at times, no, I agree. It's been, it's been that way with me at times, but I don't think that's healthy either. But it can definitely, just doing these little things can can make a huge difference. So, uh, yep, I agree. Great stuff, um, Melissa. Well, why don't you just tell uh, listeners where they can uh, find out more about you, give us your your website and your podcast and all that good stuff. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'd love to connect with you at North.com is my website, and we've got the blog there, and then the Pioneering Today podcast. All of our episodes are up there. You can go there. And then I would love to connect to, uh, like Harold, you mentioned, uh, Facebook.com mm-hmm. slash Melissa K. Norris. We do a live show there, usually every Thursday. And if you've got the cool, this cool software, here's where the modern part comes out. If you want to get notified before we do our live shows, if you just message me, and like when you send someone a private message mm-hmm. on Facebook, on the Facebook page there, the words get started, then 10 minutes before we go live, it will send a message to your to your wow. phone via Facebook and says, hey, we're going live in 10 minutes. This is the topic. Um, and so you can, you know, tune in if you want. Of course, we hope you do. And if not, then, you'll, you know, you'll know for the next week. But because we do get so busy, <laughs> I tend to forget a lot. And so I love having that remind you before something because <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Right, this yeah. is great. So. Yeah, so I would, yeah, there is information on the, on the books and the classes. And, um, yeah, so I would love to, it's so much fun to have a community because we all really do inspire each other. You know, I get inspired by other homesteaders and what other people are doing. And so it just, it just creates this, um, excitement and encouragement. Or if you do have a failure, you know, you go with people who get it, you can go and talk to them and you'd be like, you know, this happened or this happened and you'll get some tips, but you really get encouragement. And we all need that encouragement. I don't care what stage of homesteading you're at. We all need encouragement at one time or another. And, and that's what I was telling you before we started the podcast that I, I feel like this podcast is more about just encouraging and inspiring people more so than even just the, the know-how because I find that you, you can get answers to you know, on anything, anywhere, pretty much, but it's it's really nice to have that encouragement to keep going, you know, and, and to make yourself want to go look things up to learn how to do something new. And I I just love it that we have communities where we can encourage one another and be part of that. And, and I appreciate you being in our Homestead Front Porch Facebook group for this podcast. Uh, you're in there interacting a lot and uh, helping people out and, and giving advice, and I, I'm really thankful that you're in there doing that. Oh, thank you. I was, I was thrilled when I found it. I'm like, oh, that's an awesome <laughs> idea. So yeah, it's fun. It's, it's exciting too, especially when you see someone just starting out, like there's mm-hmm. just something infectious about it, about their energy and their excitement. Like I say, just it all boils back down to encouragement. So yep. thank you. Well, it, it's, it's a, it's a blessing being part of this community. And, and like you said, it's just, uh, I, I'm, I, I feel, I feel encouraged having, you know, Facebook and YouTube and things like that that just keep me going because I don't know, sometimes you just feel like uh, maybe you don't want to get up and do all those things all the rest of your life. But, you know, you see everybody else doing it all the time and it, and it you know, just gives you the encouragement and the inspiration to keep going. So I need it as much as anybody else. So I think that's half the reason I do the podcast is not just about everybody else, but I'm kind of selfish. I do it for me to <laughs> keep myself going. <laughs> I love it. Yep, we bless other people, and we're getting blessed at the That's same right. time. So it's, right. so it's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on, uh, Melissa. This has been this has been a great uh, great having you on, and uh, maybe I have you back on again sometime. And talk talk about some other things. Yeah, I would love to come back on, and yeah, thank you for inviting me. I'm I'm thrilled to to be on. I'm feeling honored. I'm like, oh, it's my first time on, so it's always exciting. So thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, we'll uh, we'll see you in the homestead front porch. Yes, we'll see you there. Thanks. Have a great holiday. <laughs> you too. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye. 
Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview. I'm sure you did. I, I really enjoyed uh, chatting with Melissa. And I, I cannot recommend enough that you go check out her stuff. Uh, I have been... I have been on her Facebook page and uh, following her website and her podcast for a long time, and I've just gained so much from her. So uh, go check out Melissa's Facebook page, her website, her podcast, and get those books. Get her first book, The Made From Scratch Life, and check out her her second book. I have not yet got it, but I'm going to get it. I'm sure it's great. Uh, handmade, and, and if you're really into that and you're really wanting to learn uh, some new stuff, check out her master class. I'll have links to all those things in the show notes, so go check them out. And uh, yeah, just uh, hit, hit Melissa up at the, the Homestead Front Porch Facebook group. Uh, that's our Facebook group for this podcast, if you're new to this podcast. And uh, if you're not yet a member, all you have to do to be a member is just ask. Uh, it's a closed group, but just ask, and we'll get you, we'll get you right in there. And uh, Melissa's in there, and you can you can ask her anything you need to ask her, and I'm sure she'd be happy to, to answer some questions. So, uh, yeah, thanks, Melissa, again, for coming on the podcast. It was great having you. And I uh, look forward to what you're going to be doing in the future and uh, getting your new book and checking that out. So, Thanks to everyone who makes this podcast possible. For those who use our Amazon link to shop and those who uh, uh, donate through PayPal and, and whatnot. I uh, really appreciate that. And uh, if you want to see the show notes for this episode, it's episode 69. So it's smalltownhomestead.com forward slash 69. And until next time, happy homesteading. God bless. Thanks for listening. To see the show notes for this podcast or listen to other podcast episodes, go to smalltownhomestead.com. There you can also read our blog, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+, and take advantage of the many resources we make available to help you along in your homesteading journey. Please share this podcast and help us to carry out our mission of helping others to homestead today for a better tomorrow.